Hey everybody, Dr. Nicholas Thomas here. We just finished recording a great special episode of The Hospitality Spirit. This episode was hosted by Joseph Leroy, Operations Manager and Instructor for the School of Hospitality Leadership. Joseph hosted this episode because he's teaching a brand new course in the School of Hospitality, HSP 398, The Business of Craft Beer. His guest on The Hospitality Spirit was Liz Garibay. Liz Garibay is with the award-winning Bruzium here in Chicago. Liz is a perfect example of how we bridge the gap between academia and the hospitality industry with a specific focus on craft beer. I hope you enjoy this great episode. Good afternoon, everyone. Live from the corner of State and Jackson in downtown Chicago, it's the hospitality spirit. Standing in for Dr. Nick, this is Joseph Leroy, joining you here today with a very special guest, Liz Garibe. Hi. How are you guys? Good, good. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for for coming. Um, How are you? How's how's life? I'm good. Uh, Life is is pretty good right now. Um, It's been a very busy year, and uh, it's, it's the end of the year now, so finally some time to sort of breathe, settle, and get a few uh, loose ends wrapped up uh, as we forge into 2020. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, I had the opportunity about a month ago to, to meet Liz uh, during the uh, Beer Culture Summit in Chicago. Um, it's a pretty exciting event. But before we get into all that, let's have an opportunity to kind of get to know our guest. Uh, Liz, tell me a little bit about yourself. Uh, what's your background um, and, and uh, what do you do? Yeah, um, i born and raised in Chicago uh, in Old Town. Uh, back when Old Town was very different than it is today. Um, went to high school here. Um, when I was 15, I got an internship at the Field Museum uh, in the anthropology department. I always kind of liked old things. And I started really kind of uh, collecting these tavern histories uh, just for fun. Um, but when I started to realize that, you know, if you collect the history of a tavern in one neighborhood and you start connecting the dots, you get the history of that neighborhood through the lens of those taverns. And then if you connect the dots further, you get the history of city through those different taverns and those different neighborhoods. So I immediately switched gears um, in sort of my approach to what I do, and I decided that I was going to look at history through the lens of alcohol. And that is really what I started to do in the late 90s, early 2000s, and, and translated it into my work at the History Museum. and just kind of grew from there. So a lot of people today call me a beer historian. I don't necessarily consider myself a beer historian because I don't look at the history of beer the way people might think about, sorry, this is how beer is made. This is what, how people made beer in, in Egypt. I don't really talk about that. What I really look at is how um, the role that beer has played in society, uh, the development of communities, development of cities, development and economies, um, events, people, and sort of what we can learn from, from beer and its connections to people. That's, it's it's interesting, the marriage, uh, like you had said, you know, of, of the history and the beer and, and these taverns. I mean, I imagine there's quite a few foggy stories. Yeah. Maybe a few fish that grew a little bigger, right. uh, so to say. Um, and, you know, the skill set that you'd have, um, you know, uniquely put you in a position to root out, uh, I guess, where the line really was. And, and that had to be just intensely fascinating, I'm sure. Yeah, I mean, you know, when you dedicate so much of your life to graduate school, and, you know, like I said, I was, this is the path I was on since I was 15, and, you know, when you realize at the age of 29 that you've been doing it all wrong, it's a really scary and sort of um, just a really hard decision to make. Uh, I remember sitting there in Boston sort of agonizing about what I was going to do and, and realizing all these years I had put in, you know, and walking away from a grant and, and all kinds of things. And obviously I was in a very special position for an education and, and was not unaware of the opportunities that had been presented to me in, um, again, with the funding and even with the universities I was affiliated with. But I knew that deep down it just wasn't for me and I was incredibly unhappy. So walking away from it was incredibly difficult, but it was probably the best decision I've ever made. Sure. So I guess this is kind of where your story transitions into history on tap. Yes. 
So tell us a little bit about your adventures with History on Tap. So after I started collecting a lot of these different tavern histories, I started to write them down for myself mostly. It was really a, a hobby, I guess, if you will. Um, and what I discovered was when I would sit around with my friends and talk about history, no one ever really wanted to hear anything I had to say. <laughs> Right, and I found myself in that position too, even in school. Like, oh, this is this. I don't want to talk about this guy. This is the worst. He's the most boring lecturer of them all, and blah 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 blah. But what I realized was, when you sit down with people and you have a beverage, right, and you take them out of that sort of classroom context, and you sit in a bar, you sit in a very social place, and you share a drink, people become very interested in talking to you about anything. And my friends, who are a great example of that, wanting to know more about history as we were drinking. And the other part about that is that not only is it a social experience, right, to have a, a meal or a beverage with someone, but the other part about that is when you start drinking, all those inhibitions go away, right? And so I always tell people that if they're trying to learn a, a different language, start drinking and start talking. Um, because all of a sudden you feel like, you know, you can say anything and nothing, no one will care. And what happens is, is that you start to practice, right? You start to sure. say things and people understand that what you're trying to say and they appreciate that you're trying. And it's kind of the same thing with history and in a lot of these sort of like headier topics. Um, a lot of people can sometimes be intimidated by names, numbers, facts, figures, but the minute sort of those inhibitions go away, it becomes a conversation. And so I really saw a lot of value in that. So while I was writing down a lot of my stories, for me, I was encouraged by my friends to share them with other people. So this is this is the late 90s, early 2000s, right? So I had a blog, um, <laughs> and I called it History on Tap. I originally actually called it Tales, Taverns, and Towns, but it was a little bit too uh, alliterative. Um, <laughs> so I switched to History on Tap, and then I was at the History Museum for seven years. Um, and I not only did history pub crawls, but I do different kinds of lectures, um, different different kinds of tours or experiences that really kind of showcase the city. Um, but always connected it to alcohol. Uh, so by the time I left the History Museum, it was just I was kind of outgrowing my position there, and, and I wanted to do a lot more, and I knew I couldn't do it in that, in the, in, within those four walls. So I left the museum to work for myself. Uh, I got, get another scary decision, right, to sort of freelance consult uh, and have my own uh, business. And so History on Tap ended up being like my consulting firm. Um, it grew into a website. All right, it grew into me doing a lot of lectures and tours and, and different things and kind of just evolved very quickly, very, um, I, in a way I didn't really see it. You know, I, I was really focused on Chicago and then I was really focused on the Midwest and, and next thing I knew I was doing things in other countries. Wow. Um, so it, it really kind of grew and, and the reason for that is because, you know, I don't care, you know, who you are, who your parents are, what you do for a living, how much money is in your bank account. Um, the color of your skin, we all connect to beer in some way, shape, or form. You know, sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad, <laughs> but there's a connection, right? And sure. so that personal connection is really what transcends a lot of these boundaries that we have as human beings, and even not just you know um, geographically, but really kind of on a much more higher level, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, so that what that's what history on tap has become and it's still sort of is there. I do a lot of public things that I'll sort of announce a tour or random things whenever I, I kind of put something together, but I do a lot of uh, private things for the most part now. So what were your favorite spots on the tour? I mean, uh, Old Town, I, you, you've talked about, you mm. know, being kind of an important neighborhood for you personally. Uh, yeah, that's so. always gonna be a, a one that holds a special place in my heart. And actually it's one that I do a lot because people ask me f to do it quite a bit. Um, I, you know, I, it, it just really depends. I'll, I'll focus a lot of like a walking things in different neighborhoods. I'll do things um, sometimes by train and, and hit up different neighborhoods or I'll focus on a topic, mm -hmm. uh, for example. Um, you know, I think I've, at one point I, I've counted that I've done over 160 different kinds of tours. Wow. Uh, focused on different, again, sort of topics or places. Um, I, don't, I don't know that I have a favorite um, I sometimes I'll come up with some goofy stuff, uh, which is kind of fun. Um, I like to challenge myself because a lot of times the stuff it gets really repetitive, or it can get repetitive. Um, so I think the ones that are a little bit off the wall can be a little bit more fun. Sure. Yeah, you got to mix it up. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Especially when you're the one 
presenting the material yeah. over and over again. You know, there has to be something to keep you invested, keep you excited, totally. I'm sure. And, you know, when you're doing these things, I imagine different people, you get to see a different side of people, uh, you know, a tour, an architectural tour mm. can be exciting. But like to your point earlier with a beverage, people probably warm up a little more. I mean, I imagine some of these tours have unique stories in themselves almost. I mean, yeah, I mean, you, you can certainly connect certain architectural elements, for example, of a building to beer, mm -hmm. right? People would never see that. With some of the Schlitz um, buildings, yeah, for sure, the tight houses, pretty, yeah, those are neat. those are big, bold, and obvious, yeah, <laughs> right. But they're like even other little elements here and there where there's there's remnants of the brewing industry or of a of a beer story or something, mm -hmm. and you know, it just um, it's just a neat way to look at the city, yeah, or any city for that matter. So then, you're doing this for a number of years, um, and I guess deep in your heart. The anthrop anthropologist, the museum curator in yeah. you is 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 brewing, um, metaphorically. Use well all enough. the puns you want. Yeah, I love them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, and and um, you get an idea or, or kind of a, a passion, and and it turns into the Bruseum, which yeah. has has, in my experience and, and what little I know, grown so much already. Um, so why don't you kind of introduce us? to the Bruseum, which is, I would argue, your biggest project on your plate now, although yeah. there's, there's you, know, shoot, um, you know, always exciting new things, but, um, you know, how, how did it start? Um, you know, what did it come from? Where is it now and, and where is it going? You know, I, I think this is going to be, you know, a pretty exciting thing, I think not just for Chicago, but, you know, for the industry and for everything else. So give us some background on the Bruseum and, and, yeah. and what it is. Um, well, you know, again, my background has always been in academic research and writing and then later on in, in um, museum exhibition uh, writing, curatorial, and then it grew into doing more experiential things, so, so the programming. Um, and when I was at the History Museum, I had the opportunity to serve on exhibition teams, so using that past expertise to advise on exhibitions we were doing. Um, so it was a really neat dynamic process because I was able to create one-time events and then I was also able to translate a lot of material um, into exhibits. But they were always very specific topics, right? So I'd always wanted to create an exhibit on Chicago beer history. Um, and I you know, presented information and really pushed for it and every time I did, they just said, no, nah, it's not the right time. And when I left the History Museum, it was sort of like one of those things that you can't shake you know, it's always kind of haunting you. <laughs> and it, was, it never panned out at the History Museum. But when I left there, I was just like, you know, I really want to do this exhibit. I wonder who could possibly do it. And as I'm putting things sort of a little bit more together um, with new data, right, that I would collect from the Brewers Association or sort of to prove that, you know, craft beer is actually an industry to a, take a, a look thing. at. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Um, I just kind of got a wild hair and was like, you know what, screw this. There's, there's too much information for just a mere exhibit. I want a whole museum. So the funny thing is, in the meantime, I did do that exhibit. I did that at the Elmhurst History Museum. Um, and uh, that process really sort of creating the actual exhibit for them really sort of, for me in my head, created a proof of concept that the exhibit not only was viable, it was certainly successful at that small suburban organization, right? So imagine what an exhibit would have been like at a larger, more mainstream museum. And then it certainly made me realize that a whole museum could absolutely function. So I got this idea to do this museum. And I'm fortunate to serve on a few boards with um, sort of other uh, cultural folks around the, around the city who advise on these boards. So the first thing I did was meet with a few of them and said, hey, here's my idea, and gave them my little, you know, janky piece of paper where I had sketched out a few things and sort of went through it. And amazingly, these people, you know, when I said to them, hey, here's my idea. What do you think of it? Does Chicago need it? Does the country need it? And more importantly, when it comes time, would you fund it? And again, amazingly, everyone was incredibly excited about the idea of it. Um, they kept saying, it's gonna be a lot of work, but go build a great team and make it happen. So I did, I, I built a couple of boards and I knew, again, coming from my background, 
everything that I've ever done has always been multidisciplinary. I, I don't think that we should live in these tunnels, right? Um, we, we have great information in these different sectors, and people coming together to share their knowledge is what's going to make something all the better. So on my boards, I got people whom I highly respected in the beer industry, in the museum industry, and in um, other sectors, so historians, authors, um, a diverse group of folks that, you know, the goal was when you look at the list of people on our boards, that would be enough for you to understand that it's a legitimate effort. <laughs> um, and so that's what I did, and we got to work, and that happened. Uh, so that idea all happened in 2013. In 2014, we had our first board meeting. We spent time sort of hashing out a vision, mission, brand, identity, timeline, all those things that you have to do. Got our 501c3, nonprofit. Um, and in May of 2016, we hosted a small event with some partners and media and said, hey, we're the Chicago Bruseum. We're doing this. And people were excited but skeptical because <laughs> it's an idea, right? It's mm -hmm. just an idea. Unless it's something to do, it's literally just an idea. So for the next couple of years, we just hosted a, a slew of events, and I kept building on those cultural partnerships that I had already had. And um, one of those, <laughs> amazingly, back to the Field Museum we go, one of those cultural partnerships was with the Field Museum. You know, and, and the interesting part is with, it wasn't with my colleagues in the anthropology department. Many of them had left. Um, I, didn't, I wasn't part of that world anymore. And so this was more on the side of the beer side of things. The Field Museum has their own beers. So my colleague, Megan Williams, uh, at the Field Museum, who's responsible for all of their beers, came to our launch and said, let's have lunch. And you know, she's like, I love this idea. It only justifies what we're trying to do. We should support each other. Uh, let's work together. And so we started doing a, a slew of events here and there. And those conversations naturally turned into, hey, how would the Bruseum like an exhibit at the Field Museum? And you know, for me, that was sort of like dream come true, full circle. Yes, I want to do this. I've been wanting to do this exhibit for I don't know how long. Um, so the original idea for that exhibit was sort of the beginnings of beer in the world and in Chicago to highlight the Field Museum's collections and, and their knowledge and to highlight sort of my, my, my focus, which is mostly 17th, 18th, 19th century United States. Um, not possible because they don't have the resources, right? They didn't have staff or we didn't know what condition some of the objects might be in and if they would need some help and some you know, aid to, to be able to present them. So we shifted gears and just did the beginnings of beer in Chicago in the 19th century. Um, and so we got to work and in uh, May of 2018, presented our final pitch to the team at the Field Museum. And they said, great, go for it. We'll give you the space, you guys write it, curate it, find the objects, design it, build it, pay for it, it's yours. <laughs> and we were like, whoa. <clears throat> wow. Okay. It's real. Yeah, but how am I going to do all those things? Yeah. <laughs> so you just do it. You know, you put your head down and you do it. And because our board was made up of all those different people from those disciplines, right? We actually already had an instant museum exhibit team. We had a graphic designer, we had a writer, we had a historian, we had an exhibit developer, and we got to work. Um, and we partnered with a couple of great companies who saw our vision and were able to help us out at a, at a discount. And slowly we knew that we would raise the money. So the green light was given to us in May of 2018 and we opened on November 2nd, 2018. So we did a lot pretty fast. And all of a sudden, all those people who were excited about the idea of the Chicago Museum, but we're skeptical because it was just an idea suddenly walked through the doors of the Field Museum, saw a Chicago Museum exhibit and said, this is legit, this is happening. Holy cow, let's, 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 let's rally as a city and make this happen because no other museum like this exists in the world. I did a lot of research on what's out there, right? You always have to do uh, competition sure. research. And there are beer museums for sure that exist. Usually they're small um, and have a lot of stuff in them, right? So a great example is the Potosi Museum in Potosi, Wisconsin. Yes, I've an actually old been brewery, there. Right? Yeah. A lot of, lot, it's got a restaurant and beer and stuff. That cellar right? basement space with the yeah. water. A lot of but old yeah. cans and bottles and things. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, Brussels, you know, has a very similar sort of situation. No, no beer, 
Well, actually, they have three, two little taps, I think. No food, but literally just stuff um, in a very small room. Or they're massive, right? Guinness. Um, sure. All right. That's a, that's like a that's like Disneyland. Yeah. But it's focused on that brand, right? It's of their course. story. So the way that I really wanted to present beer. So again, not this is how you make beer. This is how beer has been presented in all over all over the world. It's more about the social role of beer uh, through time and space. It just didn't exist. Um, our vision is to have a thirty thousand square foot facility, permanent exhibition focused on Chicago because that's where we're going to be. And then two temporary exhibitions, one that will tell the story of beer in a different city, allow us to collaborate with other cities and breweries and cultural organizations around the world. And then a third gallery that is a little bit of a crapshoot, right? Let's us let's us do whatever we want. Let <laughs> us be reactive or proactive to things happening in the world and in- introduce other genres uh, into what we're doing. Um, event space, classroom space, uh, rooftop beer garden, and of course a tap room. Um, so that as a whole just doesn't exist anywhere else. So for us to sort of be rooted in, in Chicago, and after people saw that exhibit at the Field Museum, um, it really just sort of sent us to a different plane. Um, it really kind of elevated who we were um, and allowed us to partner in various ways with other cultural organizations around the country. And that's really what has been what we've been up to for the last couple of years. Yeah, wow. What a what a terrific story! Yeah. I mean, it's it's uh, still at the Field Museum, by the way, everybody. Yeah, no, and and having been there recently, um, you know, it's I, I pride myself on on my knowledge of the Chicago beer scene and the Chicago craft beer scene, but Chicago's got a pretty unique um, and just amazing beer history behind it. I mean, prohibition obviously has affected the whole country and it gives us a very unique, you know, American story with alcohol, but Chicago in particular, um, you know, and that exhibit really explores kind of a, a pivotal moment, I guess, in not just in, in alcohol and, and uh, I guess prohibition, but in some of the racial tensions and, and, yeah. um, you know, uh, a uniquely American story. I mean, maybe give a little background for our listeners who maybe aren't yeah, familiar. Yeah, so the exhibit actually only covers 1833 to 1893. Um, it's a it's a only 800 square foot space. Uh, there's a lot in there um, that we, we wanted to cover and that we actually do cover. Um, but we chose those sort of bookends very specifically. 1833 is when Chicago is an official township. So we start out as a little village and we go to a township and then we become a city. So our, we become a city in 1837, but we become a township in 1833. So that is a very important date um, that we often forget about. Our first brewery uh, was established in 1835. So very, very uh, young, swampy town already had a, a very small brewery. Um, and we end in 1893 because the 1893 World's Fair, of course, is a significant uh, event in Chicago history, but it's also the very first time that the beer industry is sort of on a major global stage talking about its uh, innovation, its technology, um, why it's a wonderful elixir or a tonic. You know, these are some of the words that people are using in their different brochures to talk about their beer. So it's very much a time when beer is very present present and very powerful. Uh, The Field Museum is also born out of the 1893 World's Fair. So that was a great connector for us. And we just celebrated a big anniversary um, uh, of the fair and of the Field Museum. So the bookend of dates was very specific. And then we had to you know, kind of fill that in with all of this um, information. And there's so many things that we could have talked about. But there were three main stories that I really wanted to focus on for this small exhibit. And one was the growth of Chicago. And the other one was the growth of the beer industry. And I really wanted to talk about those two because, well, that's kind of the focus of it, right? That's, that's We want to see the way those two are kind of growing together and how they're sort of married together in a way. Because I often argue that beer built Chicago. You know, it's not just the stockyards and the railroads, but I often talk about the beer industry. And the third thing, and probably the most important thing, was that I really wanted to highlight the immigrant story. Um, if it weren't for our immigrants that came to the United States and to Chicago uh, during the 1820s, 30s, and 40s, um, our beer industry would never have existed. 
And uh, it's a very powerful story because they had to fight a lot of adversity. They were very much hated. There's a lot of anti-immigrant sentiments. We had a very anti-immigrant mayor in the 1850s. And so that story to me was going to make that personal connection, right? Make it relevant to what's happening in our world today. And that's really key of a lot of the things that I try to do is you have to make the personal connection. Otherwise, it's not going to work, right? How does this relate to me? People like to talk about themselves. People like to think about their own experiences and, and how they could possibly relate to what's happening now or what's happening somewhere else or what's happened in the past. And so that story was pivotal. So really there's those three stories that happened in the exhibition about the growth of the city, the growth of the beer industry, and why immigrants played such a crucial role in it and sort of the, the battles they had to fight just to just to have a beer, really. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. yeah. So um, those are the sort of the, the, the three main uh, narratives uh, in the exhibit. And there's four sections. and. Um, it really is focused on, we do it by uh, a couple of decades. So 1830s and 1840s is section one, 1850s, 1860s is section two, uh, 1870s uh, and 1880s get their own section, 1893 gets its own section because there's so much to cover. Um, and then we relate it, the section names are related to uh, beer making process, right? The raw ingredients, mm -hmm. fermentation, uh, the mash, you know, uh, maturation. Um, so you see the connections. And, and so that's kind of uh, the stories we told. And again, very complicated uh, stories. We do have, um, I guess I want to say, uh, one, two, three, four, five-ish interactives, which is a lot for, yeah. for um, a very small space. Um, you know, you can push a button and hear a fiddle. There's some uh, uh, smell stations of, of things at these benches. There's a big video screen that shows you how beer is made, but also kind of overlaps it with the growth of the city. Um, there's a beer uh, label making station, and and there's a video. There's a very uh, sort of crazy event that happened in our history, 1855. Um, basically, we had an anti-immigrant mayor, and he wanted to really sort of attack the Germans and the Irish and other immigrants who were working in the beer industry and the bar industry, and so. He um, basically made it illegal for bars to be open on Sundays. Um, and this is really anyone's only, the only day off people had back in the day, right? And so on their day off, what do you want to do? You want to drink. Um, so bars were, could not be open on Sundays. And then he also raised um, liquor license fees to extraordinary amounts so people couldn't afford to stay open. So it's a very difficult topic to talk about because ultimately Levy Boone, the mayor, um, does not have his way and um, immigrants rally and sort of cause a riot and create Chicago's very first moment of civil unrest and, and do all kinds of amazing things. And so it's a very difficult topic to just address in a label, right? Sure. So we created a video, and um, it's a short, I think, two and a half, three minute video that tells you the story. Um, it's narrated by actor Michael Shannon. People are like, oh my gosh, how did you have the money, <laughs> the, the means to get Michael Shannon? And I'm like, I don't. We drink at the same bar. I just asked him if he would do it for us. So he's like, yeah, sure, I'll narrate it. And that's the beauty of being a regular at a bar, right? Mm -hmm. Go drink at your local watering hole. And so Michael narrated it for us, and we created this really cool thing. And I will tell you that you guys are the first to know, on Tuesday, just a couple of days ago, uh, our video uh, won an award at the Illinois Association of Museums uh, Conference for Best uh, Interactive Video in a, in a museum exhibit so that's pretty exciting because here we don't even have a museum yet and our museum's winning awards that's that's it's so exciting i mean goodness yeah all, all these uh accreditations all these exciting it's nuts yeah I know. so um yeah and the exhibit actually was set to end uh in january coming up here in 2020 but it's been extended to july 5th 2020 so everyone has plenty of time to still go see it and yeah, get out to your local museum. So again, over at the Field Museum, and uh, yeah, it's 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 a great exhibit. So yeah, so we're getting there. Absolutely. So about a month ago, um, and and this is actually how I had the opportunity to meet Liz. Um, you know, I got to attend the the Beer Culture Summit, which is an opportunity yeah. to blend the um, movers and shakers in the industry, um, academics and enthusiasts to kind of come together and, and talk about beer people and, and I guess our city, um, and really just the general trends in the industry. And, um, you know, I'm 
terribly curious, like how on earth did you put such a, a big event on? I mean, you yeah. had Metropolitan there, you know, the, the number of breweries that were involved for me was, was terribly exciting, yeah. but you know, academics, uh, flying in to, to be involved. It was uh, a really a great experience. Tell me a little bit about putting that together. Um, well, uh, it's been something I've been thinking about for many, many years, right? Some of this stuff doesn't happen overnight. Um, in, in thinking about the Chicago Bruseum, you know, we're definitely Chicago-based, but we're not just about Chicago. Our aim is to be a national museum of beer. And so for me, having our presence in different cities is incredibly important. So we started something called uh, the Chicago Museum on Tour, where we go to a different city and we hang out for four days and we collaborate with cultural partners, brewery partners, to host conversations and events in those cities. So in April, I um, did something in DC. Um, I was presenting at the Pop Culture Association, American Culture Association Conference, and sort of used that as a platform to do things at other museums, including the Smithsonian with my friend Teresa McCullough, who's the beer historian. Um, at the uh, National Museum of American History, and um, did a few things there. And then uh, in September, we did the same thing in Seattle. Um, we actually opened an exhibit uh, in Seattle, a month-long exhibit. It was called Beer and Glass. Um, uh, Pilchuck Glass School is a uh, art gallery, but also a, a sort of a, a place where people learn about glass blowing and. Um, Randy Mosher, who is in the beer industry, sort of a guru of beer, he's on our national advisory board. And Randy and I consulted um, a bunch of glass blowing artists looking at the history of classic beer glassware. And they made modern interpretations of it and did a whole art show, and people could buy it, and it was a great thing. And we did things with other cultural organizations and breweries while we were there. So that idea of doing things in other places because other places also have stories. Right? And other cultural organizations have important missions as well that sort of work with ours very well is important. And so looking at, at that sort of path, I really was thinking about all those academic conferences all of us have ever been to, right? All those museum conferences I've ever been to, all those beer fests I've ever been to. And again, almost like that th thought I had in graduate school about how we're all here for the same reason willingly because we have the means to be here and it's always sharing the same damn information with the same damn people over and over and over again, right? Valuable, but also gets really old really fast. And so in thinking about what we were doing in these different cities and thinking about these different conferences uh, that I've been to, I always thought, you know, what if we did a conference where it's a mashup of academia, museum industry, and beer industry? Um, because there are some important conversations that should be had, that can be had with people from those industries sitting at the same table. And on top of that, it shouldn't just be so insular in that it's only for those people. This should be something for the public, right? Because everybody has an interest in these different topics. So um, I started putting together this idea and I reached out to Teresa McCullough at uh, the National Museum of American History and I was like, hey, I got to bounce this idea off of somebody who sort of gets it, right? Because Teresa's an academic. She works in a museum. She works in beer. And I was like, what do you think of this? And she's like, I, it's never been done. Let's let's do it. I, I'll do it with you. And so I was like, really? And I was like, that's really exciting. So we got to work on putting together, literally the panels that we had were just things I was personally really interested in seeing. Also, I knew that we had to have panelists. So I was thinking about the people who I knew personally who were doing certain work, um, who I knew could sort of help round it out with other folks or people, you know, social media is a great thing. So you're on Twitter and you sort of see different things and different people doing things. And so I knew there are certain people who I really would wanted to include in the conversation. So started building the panels, started um, sort of having those sort of like dream team of panels and uh, vetting it um, with a few folks. And... Uh, when we kind of pulled it all together, our, our sort of our little sort of initial program, started reaching out to everybody and saying, hey, would you do this panel? And amazingly, again, people said, yeah, this is awesome. Let's do it. So the Beer Culture Summit was exactly that as a mashup of all those industries and um, had academics uh, from all over the country, had beer industry people from all over the country, had 
museum people from all over the country, and I couldn't believe that all these people flew in to Chicago just to do this for four days. Um, I was kind of, I'm writing a report about the summit right now, and we, I looked at, we had 50 different cities represented at the summit. Wow. And that's just not speakers, it's, it's also guests, attendees. Um, so people from all over the country came, you know, and it was really just a really genuinely fun and just, I don't know, it's like a nice little like kumbaya weekend. I think. Yeah. With these different industries. Yeah. I don't know. You were there. What you, what? Yeah. No, it was, I mean, it was really impressive. I was uh, lucky enough to have the opportunity to uh, tap on Nick's shoulder, Dr. Nick, uh, our regular host on the show, um, and uh, kind of explain what a unique opportunity this is. You know, um, as a hospitality program um, here in the DePaul University, you know, we we introduce students to so many new exciting things in the hospitality industry and and one of our you know most popular classes is our wine education course mm. for a number of reasons but you know it's hard to work in a hospitality setting without beverages being an important part of that yeah. conversation and um you know we have not yet had a course that spoke to the craft beer industry or really just the beer industry at all so, um, you know, I thought this was an ex excellent opportunity to kind of represent DePaul in this setting and, and have a chance to not just bump shoulders with industry, but academics that are focused on it and, and enthusiasts. And, um, you know, another new announcement for all of our listeners here, um, I'm going to be uh, having the opportunity to teach our first beer-focused course within the hospitality program. So in the spring, we'll be teaching the... Uh, the Business of Craft Beer, an exciting new course that will introduce students to um, not just a bit of the history of beer, um, but also kind of the introduction of the science of beer um, and the industry itself. And, and I guess some of the trends that, that we're seeing uh, today and, and in the past and, and kind of understand where we were and where we were going. And I think that the, the Culture Summit was a great opportunity to explore all of that because there were panels that you know focused on ancient history yeah of, beer, of beer it's really old yeah beer it's really <laughs> that's, old that's what we called was the it. panel and <laughs> it was i mean incredibly fascinating to think that some of the oldest pieces of recorded human history are about beer yep a topic that we still enjoy today yeah. you know here we are talking about it now and um you know then we got talking about um you know the 1800s and today and not just today but the future and trends that we're seeing um, not just with <laughs> ingredients or styles which are, are certainly fun and exciting to talk about and, and not just the data that comes out of the Brewers Association and things of that mm -hmm. matter but also some of the, the social issues that come up when you talk about minority presence um, you know um, gender equality and and other issues that are important across all industries but you know um, we're seeing the landscape change and it's exciting to talk about it. And this was an excellent forum for it because there was such incredible representation. And um, there were so many topics discussed that humanized, um, you know, yeah. some of the, the things about the beer industry that normally would seem inaccessible or, or it would be so hard to find a place to talk about these things or a comfortable place, I suppose. So. Totally. Um, no, it was incredibly rewarding and exciting and, and you know, um, put a fresh fire under me uh, Good. To, to kind of that put together my curriculum. You know, it's it's um, couldn't be couldn't have had a better time um, and, and it, it left an impact. So awesome. I'm glad I'm glad to hear that. But that's kind of the reactions we've been getting, not just um, well, from a, a variety of different perspectives, you know. Um, uh, it's it's nuts, you know, and the fact that we were able again, right? The Chicago Museum, an organization that barely exists and no one's ever heard of, to present this in partnership with the Smithsonian. Yeah, it was kind of a big deal. It was <laughs> right. So to do that for us, really kind of again elevated our game in a different way that the Field Museum exhibit had done, um, and for to get all the support from all the folks who did say, yes, I'll be a part of it and, and get to Chicago and, you know, spend some time there. And, and of course, even people who, you know, paid tickets to go, yeah. right? Well, and, and some of the venues were 
really neat. I mean, yeah. this was a, an event that lasted the weekend, and, um, you know, there were opportunities to go to, you know, a, a, an incredible tour of Chicago for anyone that was from out of town. Yeah, that so that was part of the, the, the strategy because, again, when you go to all these conferences, where are you usually stuck? A freaking hotel, mm-hmm. right? And it's like, what is exciting about a hotel, conference, ballroom, you know, nothing. Um, and I just, I, I, I kind of like the way we started this conversation, right? About you want to get out of that lecture hall. You want to get out of the classroom. Go to a social space. You want to have an environment because the environment informs the conversation. So I, there are certain parts where I'm like, you know, we want to have serious discussions. So wh- where do we have those? And for me, it's always a museum. Museums are going to be the place that those conversations should be had. So we had daytime sessions at the Field Museum, daytime sessions at the Chicago History Museum. But then, you know, the conversations keep going, and that's when you have the evening conversations at breweries and bars. So again, it was sort of a mashup of venues as well that again, that really kind of were relevant to the discussions that we were having. Yeah. Yeah, I, I had never taken a tour of the, the Barrel House of Goose Island. And, oh yeah, that's uh, awesome, Boy, isn't it? was that impressive. Um, and, and again, proves, you know, some of the big hitters that you've got standing in your corner uh, as you're building up this yeah. empire of a museum. <laughs> so know? John Hall, who started Goose Island, he's on our board of directors. And so mm-hmm. that's why we were at Goose the first night and gave us a very, very special private barrel house. Um, Tracy Hurst, the president of Metropolitan Brewing, is our board president, uh, which is why we were at Metropolitan. And then, you know, you start reaching out to different brewery partners. Um, to be present in different ways and, and same with cultural partners and, and, you know, try to just keep building on those relationships that you have. That's why they're so key. Well, and shameless plug, um, I was married this last weekend and um, actually had my engagement photos shot over at the Metropolitan oh, Tap nice. Room. It's, if you haven't been, I encourage you to go. It's, it's on the Chicago River. It's, yes. it's a beautiful um, floor-to-ceiling windows, and now they've got a deck out there. It's, it's awesome. Maybe not the best time of year for it, but come spring. And, hey, bring a jacket, and, and it's it's still beautiful views. We do a tour um, um, for the Chicago Museum uh, that is called the Brew Canoe. And we start at North Avenue and get into a 16th century, uh, sorry, 16th century First Nations replica canoe. And we paddle to Metropolitan. And I talk about the history of um, uh, Native Americans uh, in Chicago and how that's that their story was first. That's what we talk about first. And the river, and then we go to Metropolitan, have a beer, and then we get back into the canoe, and we paddle to Off Color, and we sing songs and do different things. <laughs> but, you know, another way to talk about beer history and, and the people who were here before us and how it all relates and how it connects to us and, and of course, drink beer. Yeah. Um, so you can actually paddle up to Metropolitan if you're there. I'm actually on my way there after this. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. So what are next steps, Liz? Where do you see yourself six mm. months from now? What are you What are you working on? What's uh, the next big venture for? Um, so we'll do another Bruzeum on tour in a different city in 2020. Uh, Beer Culture Summit 2020 will happen um, in Chicago. Um, we are. V- Working on finalizing a location for our museum. Um, there's a lot of things that we're trying, constant conversations and programs and events to, you know, really kind of just highlight different aspects of history, um, different things. We've been doing a lot of um, beer collaborations. I Any beer geek out there loves it when two breweries come together to make something, right? Yeah. It's a one-off. It's special. What's it going to be? I love these two breweries, or I've heard of this one. Who's this other one? I want to learn more. Blah, 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 blah. I love that, too. Um, But, again, there's always got to be something more to it. So what we started to do is I've wanted to create beer collabs with two breweries, but then add another layer to it, and that's a cultural collaboration. So... What we've been doing is partnering with a cultural organization in a different city, partnering with a local brewery, and then partnering with a brewery in that other city to create a four-way collaboration to make a beer. So we've done it in New Orleans. We've done it in D.C. We've done it in Seattle. Um, we just did one here uh, with Chicago and Wisconsin uh, for the part of the Beer Culture Summit. Um, we have another one debuting in April, uh, very local. It's actually only a, it's a collaboration with one 
um, cultural organization and one brewery. Um, and we just did that again with the Field Museum. The Field Museum, like I said, has a series of beers. Um, they have never partnered with another cultural organization to create a beer. Um, and so we did the very first one with them. Uh, it's called All the World is Here. It's a, um, a, a beer that is inspired by the beer industry's role in the 1893 World's Fair. It's a cream ale that's brewed by Temperance Beer Company. The can is beautiful. Go find it. You can actually find it not only at Temperance, at the Field Museum. Um, various bars in Chicago actually are carrying it. Because um, it's, it's, you can find it at Binnie's. Um, I call it, uh, and I don't know if this is a good thing to say, but it's a really, really good version of Miller High Life. I love Miller High Life. Um, that was my, that's, I learned to drink beer yeah. with Miller High Life. It's, a, it's like an even, if Miller High Life could be even better, that's kind of what it tastes like. <laughs> um, again, rooted in, in uh, 1893 World's Fair era beer style um, and using some ingredients that would have been present at the fair. Um, so beer making, to me, uh, these collaborations are important because our mission at the Chicago Museum is beer is more than just a beverage. It is a powerful cultural force with the ability to bring people together and the power to make change, right? And so if you think about any beer, that's what it is, right? It's a story in there. So for us to be able to make this beer that is able to also tell a story and have it packaged where we can actually tell the story on the label, that's just another sort of aspect of the way for us to um, share our mission and share what we're trying to do. So you'll be seeing a lot more Chicago Brewseum beers uh, in various places. That's really um, exciting. So yeah, those are kind of some of the things we're working on for 2020. Because um, like there are a lot of twists and turns, and you know, again, you beat yourself up sort of for saying, "Oh, I didn't do it this way. I, I should have done this," or you know, blah blah blah. But it's certainly um, my experiences in all of these different places have certainly been very different roads, but what has surprised me and what I'm incredibly grateful for is that all those roads led to the same place. And I'm able to use those um, relationships and those partnerships that I've built to sort of all bring them all together in a way, right? So you have a brewer and an academic sitting at the same table having a conversation that never would have happened before. And so it's for me, it's actually pretty exciting to see, like watching the Beer Culture Summit for me, even though I was busy like, you know, doing stuff, like seeing those conversations happen were pretty cool and you know when it was all over kind of just letting it all sink in I was like wow that was really special and, and people have said to me you know I have a feeling that the beer culture summit is for people who were there is going to be one of those things where they say a I was at the first one you know like Lollapalooza and b that was the moment when beer made a shift or something happened there's a shift and so th having that sort of reaction is very much sort of um, I don't know it, it's crazy to think about what you've just said in terms of sort of how it all sort of was you know stumbling along the way to make it happen for sure well for and sure. if it gets any bigger you're going to need help and all our event yeah. management students uh, yeah, you listen know, in, I'm you not, know? I, hey, listen, <laughs> I, Beer Culture Summit, I'm going to need volunteers. We barely had any volunteers last time because I really didn't know what to do. You didn't really know what to expect, right? You'd never done it before. Um, and we've hosted a lot of events, but when you have so many balls in the air, mm -hmm. um, we definitely need um, some good people to be on site to help us out. And yeah, as we're growing, we definitely need a lot more volunteers and, and, and just... Uh, expertise, you know, everything that we've done at the museum to, to date, and you guys are going to think this is bananas, has truly been by volunteers. So our logo, our website, our, all of our graphic design, um, uh, obviously, you know, aside from actually building and paying contractors uh, for the exhibit, you know, I did all the writing. Um, another colleague uh, did another all the writing. Uh, Randy Mosher is also a graphic designer. He did all the graphic design, you know, the, the actual exhibit design. So everything that we've done is truly just people saying, this is cool. I want to be a part of it. How can I help? I'm like, well, what do you know how to do? I'm yeah. sure I need your help, right? <laughs> so for sure. Yeah, well, hey, they've got a website. Um, yeah, chicagobrazium.org. Um, I'm trying to think what's up there right now. Um, we actually have an event in Metropolitan tonight, so I won't talk about that because it won't be relevant. Um, Oh, uh, 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 so I mentioned that for, with History on Tap, I did a lot of international things. 
Um, so a lot of the stuff that I do for History on Tap overlaps with the Bruseum now, of course, because it's very similar. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, February, for those of you who want to get out of Chicago in February, because it's going to be so damn cold, we're hosting the very first ever Chicago Bruseum International Journey, uh, open to the public. Um, uh, myself and co-hosted by the Bruseum and Five Rabbit Brewery here in Chicago, we're going on a four-day drinking and learning journey through Mexico City. So I think there's only four spots left uh, on that trip because it's very small. It's only, we're only taking 12 people um, because we want to make sure that it's a, it, it's a very good experience for everyone, right? When you have masses and masses of people, that's no fun for anyone. So we want to make sure that it's very personal and intimate. Um, so I think we only have four spots left. So uh, Mexico City, February 5th through the 9th is the way we're kicking off 2020. So come hang out with us. Yeah, drink you beer. heard it here. Drink beer, drink mezcal, drink tequila, eat a lot of food. Uh, we're working with a lot of local friends and colleagues um, to create, again, that sort of insider's experience, a very genuine experience. I think that about wraps it up. Thank you so much yeah. for uh, spending some time with us, talking about your unique story and, and some of the me. things that you're doing here in Chicago and, and around the world. Yeah, 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 yeah. Anyone um, interested, chicagobruseum.org. We're also on Twitter and on Instagram and on Facebook, um, at Shy Bruseum is our handle. Uh, that's really kind of, um, again, we don't, we're very grassroots. We don't have money for marketing. So all of our stuff comes through social media and uh, our newsletter and our website. So follow. Well, and I understand you have a podcast as well. Yeah. Um, I, I don't talk about the podcast so much because it's kind of dumb. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I have a podcast with the owner of my favorite bar. I do have a favorite bar. It's kind of crazy to think I have a favorite bar because there's so many bars out there that are so great. But my favorite bar is called the Old Town Ale House. And Bruce Elliott is a little bit of a rock on tour, if you will. Um, he's also a knucklehead. And, and it, to think that one of my best friends is a 79-year-old white guy uh, is kind of funny. Um, but he and I just have really kind of nonsensical conversations um it's i call it the seinfeld of podcasts you don't ever you never know what you're gonna get like don't think don't tune in and think you're gonna know what you're gonna talk about it (laughs) it really is just stupid stuff we have a lot of guests who are regulars at the bar or coming through town or whatever um it's called as the ale house turns um you can find it on soundcloud and itunes um but yeah we record every week at the bar and uh just have these dumb talks (laughs) (laughs) well I guess that's the conclusion of our dumb talk. Yeah. Um, again, thank you again for, for coming in yeah, no and uh, being a sport with us. Thank you for all that you do for the Bruseum and for the industry and academics at large. And uh, we'll be sure to keep our finger on the pulse and, yes, and, please do. and get involved, not just as a school, but you know, as individuals, I think. so. Yeah. On the north side of Chicago, it's the coolest bar in town. And if you go up there, you better just be one.